you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call. Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, who am I, who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? true that you are thinking of me, how you love me. Oh Lord, it's amazing. I am a friend. I am a friend of God. Yeah, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me of God. Yeah, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. Is it true, Lord? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? Oh, Lord, it's amazing. I am a friend. I am a friend of God. Please be seated. So we don't give titles to sermons anymore. If I were to title this, I would call it 
how to stand out like Jesus. I have often stood out in my life for a variety of reasons. In junior high, I was usually the first name called in morning announcements for those who needed to come and see the principal. When I was 40, I I went to get my first tattoo, and uh, I brought in a design which you can see here. uh, This is my my tattoo. It's not quite that large because my arm's not quite that large, but I I had an idea that, that I wanted the three crosses, and so I drew them out and took them into the tattoo artist put it on the counter and and said effectively uh, how much, and and the tattoo artist looked like uh, a rattlesnake was in the shop. They reared back and they said, no, no, that's horrible. No, no, you need a a sunrise and some white clouds and some red. You need Jesus on the cross. We could give him a crown of thorns. We could put a little sparrow on his shoulder, right? Do you you know what that's called? Upselling, right? It's the same thing as when you go through the drive-thru and you said like a, a, a cheeseburger and fry and, and they say, would you like a hot apple pie with that too? So I explained to them that I didn't want art on my arm. I just wanted this because it had a meaning t- to me. And uh, so the actual owner of the shop didn't deign to, to do such simple work. He called a lady who was a tattoo artist also. I sat in the chair and she was relatively nervous, I think. She, she put out her cigarette and then uh, washed her hands. <laughs> and uh, she knew that I was a minister because, as you know, right, there's just a, a certain aura about me. Uh, <clears throat> also, as odd as it is, you have to fill out some paperwork, and, and so that was on the paperwork. So she said to me before she started the tattooing, so what, what does a minister actually do? Which is harder than you might think to explain, right? So so I thought about it for a second, and then uh, this is a a direct quote. I I said, oh, oh, honey, oh, golly, Uh, I read a lot, and and then the stuff that I read, I turn into talks uh, to help educate people in the church uh, uh, about how to follow Jesus. That's a relatively decent explanation, don't you? She said, Oh, hold on just a second. I'll, I'll be right back. And, and then she went over to the, to the next booth in the tattoo shop, and she said, hey, whatever, Bill, you, you, got, you got to come see this guy. He just said, I'm not kidding you. Oh, golly. <laughs> As I said, I, I've managed to stand out many times in, in my life. We went to a tattoo convention in Sacramento. No, that's not correct. We went to annual conference in Sacramento. But while we were on a break, we, we decided to tour the tattoo convention, which is in the same building. Um, and and uh, wow, that was fascinating. It was uh, interesting in, in all kinds of ways. I, I really was not spiritually or emotionally prepared for, for what we encountered in the uh, tattoo uh, show. So what it is is a bunch of booths with ha- tattoo artists um, tattooing people. While, while you watch. That, that was fascinating in and of itself. And there are basically two kinds of tattoo art. One is like evil cartoon art. Does that make sense? So if you think about a, a clown with bloody fangs or, or if you think of, about a, uh, uh, a demon with bloody swords or th- that kind of stuff. And quite often those are quite large back tattoos or, or full arm t- tattoos. They're interesting, uh, and, and actually, really good artwork. If, you, if you've ever seen somebody tattooed, you might know it's a high art because it's not like a painter on a canvas. The, the canvas ideally doesn't move or give, but human skin does, right? Plus humans, if, if you pinch them a little bit and hurt them, they're, they're going to twitch. So they're able to do 3D type of art with all kinds of nuance and shadows. They're really good artists. The, the second kind of, of art... I, I would say is more classical art. So there were some beautiful tattoos that I saw. Uh, one lady in, in particular had a, a tattoo of uh, Christ on, on the cross, but the, the perspective was from ab- above and, and kind of looking down, and it was just magnificent. Had it been on a canvas, I, I would have bought it. It was really beautiful, kind of black, black and white, but, but just absolutely uh, lovely. So we were, I'm going to say, going away the oldest people there. 
it's important that you know I was the youngest of the oldest people there. <laughs> and we kind of stood out a, a little bit because uh, my tattoo is in, in a place where if you can see it if I want you to see it, but, but if not, then um, uh, not. And we were amongst people who did not go by that particular theory of tattooing, right? There, there were people who were tattooed literally from, from head to toe. Uh, um, uh, sleeves is what they're called if you're... Uh, whole arm is tattooed or, or both legs or whatever. And, and so there were people with, with all manner of uh, tattoos and all number of tattoos. There were a lot of Anglo folks and there were a lot of, a lot of Latino folks. There were a handful of uh, black folks. Um, so it was pretty representative, I think, of, of the community uh, of Sacramento. And the thing that you did was you just walked down the, the row and, and you watched people... Um, getting tattoos. It, it, was, it was interesting. Let me give you an equivalent to it, and this might sound strange, but it, it really is, in my mind, the equivalent to it. So I, I, I used to be a bouncer in a bar in Wyoming. Now, now that, that should be the title of a book, right? Um, uh, it, it was uh, what's called an alcoholics bar. I, I don't know what you call them in California, but it, so in Wyoming, there's dance bars, and, and there's honky-tonks, and then there's kind of alcoholics bars where just hardcore alcoholics go, the same people every uh, weekend or every night, and they drink the same thing, et cetera, and, and that's the kind of bar that, that I, I was a bouncer in. And I remember I was relatively young, uh, 19 at the time. Um, I, I remember in, in my shift, my job was just kind of stand at the end of the bar and, and monitor people as they slowly either blacked out or, or got to the point where... They uh, got taken home, and, and, and I didn't know a lot of psychology or whatever, but I, I had a good enough sense to know, you, you know, I, I get what they're doing, right? The, in, in the old days, we used to call it, they're trying to forget their troubles, right? So, so, so they come every day, they, they come, and, and some of them had been there so long, they would just, they would walk in, and they'd uh, put two or three fingers up, and, and that meant bring me uh, two or three shots or whatever. So I understood that they're trying to make something inside of them go away or at least tamp it down. They're, they're dealing with stuff that probably is pretty horrendous to, to, to deal with. But my observation at, at 19 was the, the crazy thing is it doesn't appear to me that any of them could understand what you're doing doesn't actually work. You're anesthetizing. You're making yourself feel better enough maybe to go to sleep or, or whatever, but drinking in response to the difficulties of life is not a solution. It just eventually adds more difficulty to put on top of the difficulties that you started to drink heavily to escape. Does that make sense to you? Right, so again, from a 19-year-old perspective, all, all I could really think was, that's crazy, it doesn't work. Why would you keep doing something that doesn't work? Ultimately, it's doomed to failure, and before it fails completely, you're going to make things worse. And, and that was true. I, I knew a lot of the, the uh, customers, and, and most of them had a story that you already know, right? Which is, you know, nobody understands me. It's, it, it, I, I got ripped off or whatever, and uh, my wife left me, or, or my kids don't have anything to do with me. I'm, I'm all alone in the world, so I come here to be with my friends. Again, at, at 19, kind of, kind of judgmental, I, I guess, but I, I just constantly stood there and thought, man, that that's crazy that you would choose this solution because it, it just obviously doesn't work. I had kind of the same thought, I hope a little more informed by experience, at, at the tattoo convention. So I have actually studied the psychology of, of tattoos, and the vast majority of tattoos fall under just two categories. The, the first is generally called tribalism. And tribalism works like this. An event or a series of events happen in a person's life that bond them so tightly to their peer group that they then define themselves by their peer group. And, and, and that's, a, that, that's actually a necessary and good thing. So think of military tattoos. If somebody's been in the Navy or the Marines and, and, they, and they have a, a tattoo to show their service, what that tattoo tells people, if, if you pay attention is that person w was likely, uh, at least for them, in, in what was a life and death circumstance, or, or even if they didn't see combat, seemed like it was in, in training and stuff, and, and they so tightly bonded with, 
one another because they depended on each other in a way that most of us don't, that what's inside of them, which is genuine love for other people in the tribe, it's so strong that they want a mark on the outside that shows what's on the inside. That makes sense to you too, right? That, so the, the, about 70% of, of tattoos are tribalism. The, the rest of them do the same thing, but they aren't in alignment with a tribe. They are the expression of powerful emotions, many of them negative and unresolved, that people put on their flesh because both the pain of the tattoo and the showing of the art, whether it's, again, devil cartoons or, or whatever it is, right, makes them for a while feel like they've gotten what's compressed inside out of them. So one guy had, had hair uh, about as uh, long as mine, so I felt sorry for him in the first place. But he, he had a, a tattoo that covered the entirety of, of his skull, and, and it, it was a tattoo, it's kind of like a 3D tattoo, that, that showed the, the skin on uh, the head cut and, and being peeled back. And, and I, I looked at that knowing, right, tattoos express stuff inside, and you go, wow, honestly, that looks like a hard road, right? Th that looks like whatever has happened in, in that man's life, it, it must be really hard inside. So I, I don't really have a prejudice against tattoos. I understand they're just a way that people find to express stuff that's important. My tattoo came uh, on the heels of my first wife's death from cancer, and, and it expresses uh, a profound encounter by myself of the truth of resurrection. That's why the crosses are empty, right? So same thing. Uh, people who get tattoos really mostly do it to express something inside. But here's the thing. Having full sleeves or a, a whole body of tattoos, uh, beautiful, uh, it's not good or bad, but it is like the people in the bar a long time ago. My reflection as we, we walked around was, if there's that much stuff that's going on, and you're running out of skin now that you can tattoo, at some point, it should dawn on them, it's not working. It works to, to get it out of you, right? To, to, to feel, it's like cutting for uh, teenagers, right? They, they cut so they can feel something, but it isn't, it doesn't work in the long term. It doesn't actually eradicate or change or morph or, or get out in a healthy way the things, the turmoil that, that's going on inside. And, and that's not to say everybody who has a tattoo has deep turmoil or psychological problems. Uh, sometimes, you know, people just get a tattoo. But, but really, most folks who have a lot of them, they're expressing stuff as best they can through art on their body that's happening in their hearts. So I, I had two reactions. I really was amazed at the, at the art, at, at how good they are. It, it's just crazy to me that they can make pictures like that on, on human beings. Uh, I, I also managed to uh, humiliate Kelly, who, who happened to be standing beside me. I, we went to a table, and, and there were a bunch of little boxes. They looked like ornate, to me, like ornate pencil sharpeners, about the size of a, a pack of cards. So I picked one up. It was really heavy, and, and I had no idea uh, what it was. So I asked the guy, what, uh, what is this? And, and again, right, uh, my habit amongst tattoo artists is to get them to giggle. He nudged the, the lady beside him, and, and he said, <laughs> he wants to know what that is. Anybody have an idea what it was? It's a tattoo gun. They're selling tattoo guns, which gave me an idea, right? And, and uh, I began to imagine the conversation. Hey, Marilyn, I, I could draw, uh, I could put a tattoo on a, a bird or, or a lizard or, or a kai. Or... Anyway, w when they quit making fun of me, I put the tattoo gun back down and, and walked on. I didn't go past that table again. It was fascinating to be in a, in a room, a huge room, full of, of people who have beautiful art on their bodies and, and to think to myself, yeah, it's, it's cool. Actually, I, I really like tattoos, but it's ineffective. It doesn't have the power to affect the change in the way that you feel or, or the burdens that you carry inside. 
temporarily it does, I guess, but it, it doesn't long term. And for me, anyway, that's the essence of, of, of Christianity, of the faith that we have. So Christianity doesn't always work either, depending on how you practice it or, or whether or not you're kind of a tribalist. But it, it does have the power to actually dissolve and remove pain and scar that is in your heart and your soul if you just are dogged enough to, to trust and, and to keep trying to walk as a Christian, then the path of faith is actually effective at modifying how you feel inside. That's a, a way uh, to tell my own story, right? I, I have been a practicing Christian um, really all my life, but it wasn't until very late in the game that, that I stumbled on the part of Christianity that for me really unlocked it and made me do more than think I was a good person because I was Christian. In fact, it had the opposite effect. It cleared up that misconception, but it opened a channel in, in me to get rid of the, the stuff that I was battling all of my life. So gathered here this morning, there are lots of people who, if they were to drop in to look at us, they would have all kinds of opinions about what Christians are, wouldn't they, right? They, they'd say that we're a, a bunch of hypocrites and frauds, that we come here and we act all nicey-nice, and then we go out and live any way we want to, right? Uh, cuss and drink and, and uh, whatever, uh, cheat people, yada, yada. And, and they might conclude, I don't know why those people go to church. It doesn't work. It doesn't always. But the point is, at least for me, it's one of the few things, it's the, actually the only thing that I can think of that has the power to actually work. Covering your body with tattoos is beautiful, but it doesn't heal the inside. Drinking every night until you can finally close your eyes and in a stupor finally go to sleep, it doesn't work. That's not rest. All of the things that you can think about, the acquisition of things, all the things that we busy our lives trying to do to straighten out the inside, they, they prove ineffective over the whole of a lifetime. But Christianity occasionally ends up being an actual cure, actually works, right? The, the things that we talk about and the things that we do transform and change. And, and then when it draws out of you the poison that you've been carrying around, it can fill that void, not with more poison, but with a peace that transforms all the rest of your interactions. So Christianity is a way of dealing with the difficulties of life, which we all have, in which when we actually practice Christianity the way an alcoholic practices drinking to the bottom of the bottle, when we actually apply ourselves and really double down on, I'm going to do this as best I can, Christianity is a way of living that produces in us what we actually desire and need. And at least for me, everything else is a pale imitation. It doesn't work. Whatever it is, I talk about tattoos and alcohol, but it can be adventuring, it can be acquiring stuff, it can be any number of things. The only thing that has the power to actually do the thing that we want done is the Christian faith, and even then, my gosh, it takes a long time. Here's what I think I have observed in the lives of Christians who seem to have accomplished the thing in the lives of people who are graceful and who are spiritually like Christ in that people desire to be around them and respect them and trust them. All of them that I have known stand out from everybody else in this way. It's not in memorizing scripture. It's not in uh, saying flowery prayers, none of that. They, they all stand out w with one particular aspect of the faith, and that is that they are, in fact, graceful when it's hard to be. The Christians that I, I have known that I, I do think, wow, that is Christ in someone's life, they're able to hold strong opinions about right and wrong 
without defaulting to disliking those that they think are wrong and, and uh, overemphasizing those that they think are right. So they have a, a, a graceful disposition that sees human beings in whatever estate they might be or whatever opinion they might hold or whatever party they might be a part of. They, they hold them in equality and see them all as people who God has asked them to care about. I'm betting you've had the same experience that you know some people who just seem to be able to deal with difficult people or unpleasant people in, in a way that is almost mysterious sometimes. They're able to be genuine and caring even if the other person is not. So if Christianity hasn't done the thing for you yet, you're still just grinding away and grinding away, I, I would encourage you to, today to think about, well, what kind of Christianity are you practicing? Are you practicing the kind that says I'm right and everybody else that doesn't agree with me 100% is all wrong? Because that won't do the thing. That'll just make you temporarily feel better than the other people. But that's not what we are asked of by God. We are asked to learn to love the other people even if we're absolutely positive they are dead wrong. And when we begin to practice that, then the power of the enterprise somehow gains access, and begins the transformation. It doesn't change people's opinion. It doesn't change what Scripture says, but it changes the person so that they become the truth of God expressed. And the truth of God, more than any law, is that God loves his creation, even when it's horribly fallen, even when it's got a skull tattoo that shows its own scalp being ripped off. And the people of God who are transformed by God slowly learn to have the same attitude. Well, that went a long time. Any questions about tattoos? My suggestion, if you're inspired to get one after today, get it in a fleshy part of your body. The thigh's great, right? Uh, the uh, upper arm, if you've got some flesh on there. Don't be getting it close to bones. Uh, I am told that hurts a, a great deal. That's free and aside from the point. Today, our scripture <laughs> has nothing to do with being tattooed, except for it's another thing. It's, it has to do with something that's just like tattooing. It marks the body, and it changes uh, folks. Let me give you just a quick background. It's about circumcision, which is a, a mark on the body. In the ancient days, uh, people did not clothe themselves in the way that we do, and if you were circumcised, everybody knew. So they didn't have public restrooms that you politely went to, etc. So circumcision was not a secret at, at all. And, and in the time of Abram, uh, we are still in the story of Abram, tattoo, or, uh, uh, tattoo. circumcision was a mark of the Pharaoh. So the Pharaoh and all the princes in line to be Pharaoh if the Pharaoh died, they were all circumcised. A and that was clear-cut in Egyptian society. Right? So if you saw someone, if you're at the market, right, and you saw somebody who was circumcised, that person was in the royal family. Nobody else did it because it meant they were God. Purity is a word to put on it, but it's not kind of sexual purity like we think of it. The, the mark of circumcision on the Pharaoh denoted that they were different in all of their flesh and all of their being. They were gods, and only Pharaohs and their uh, uh, sons were allowed to be circumcised. So that's the historical truth that we're going to read from in the Scripture today, and, and it'll help you understand. It's a big deal what happens in Abram's life. Okay, Genesis 17, 1 through 14. Here we go. Woo! Can I get an amen? Come on. Here we go. When Abram was 99 years old, Still with no child, though God had promised him over and over and over and over and over that he's going to have a child. And you remember last time we got together, he finally short-circuited it and went and had a child, but not the way God told him to. When 99 years old, Abram's still wandering around hoping that his relationship with the invisible God will bear fruit. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. I, I, let me do that in a better God voice. <clears throat> I am God Almighty. Okay, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Walk before me and be blameless. Wow, that last part was hard. That I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Same promise God has been making since Abram 
first left Mesopotamia some probably 80 years before. Then Abram fell on his face. We talked last week about when Abram's in the presence of God, it is transformative for him. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Remember, all of this is after Abram absolutely cheated Uh, tried to cheat the process that God had laid out and had another son, treated his slave horribly. It's always worth remembering what God said he's going to do, he's going to do. He knows how we are. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. You might know that we are literally fighting a war now based at least partially on this passage. The Jewish people, the Jewish state says God gave it to us, and they're able to refer clear back to this. God said to Abram, Abraham now, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he He who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of Scripture. So the whole prelude with the uh, alcoholics bar and and the tattoo and and the trying to get stuff uh, inside uh, out of you leads up to circumcision circumcision when God began to require it from Abraham was crazy and it it would make Abram stand out happily in his lifetime not before Pharaoh he never went back to Egypt so he didn't cause offense in Egypt that would happen later but in Canaan land where, where he lived, you know, everybody noticed when the whole tribe came back circumcised. A- and they would have likely been slightly offended by the statement being made by the circumcision as it was understood. Everybody knew circumcision is for pharaohs. It's for gods in flesh. It's for the pure. It's for those who are different than the rest of us. A- and Abraham comes back and even his slaves are circumcised. Let your mind wrap around that for a second. That's crazy, isn't it? The, the mark of circumcision means somehow that you're a god, and Abraham and, and his whole troop come back and, and they're circumcised. At the very least, the other residents of Canaan would have gossiped behind Abraham's back. Some of them might have been offended on behalf of Pharaoh, but it was unique in the ancient world for God to have required this of his people. Later in the story, when the Hebrews go back into Egypt land it isn't mentioned but I think it's an astute observation to say it caused a whale of a lot of trouble for the Hebrews in Egypt because it was so offensive to have the mark of the king on your body when you weren't king you weren't even Egyptian these are common wandering herdsmen marked with the sign of the king who is God And as the faith that Abraham started rolling plays out, by the time it gets to us, to Christians, you have the exact same dynamic, but it's reversed. You have Christ, who is God, being treated as if he were a common criminal and crucified by the powers of the world. Just real quick, because we'll come back to this in, in a few weeks, but... It is an interesting dynamic that the circumcision and the crucifixion have the same 
look and appearance about them, which is both teach in a general way that human beings are all the same and only God is God. Christ, who is the king, crucified as a commoner because he's in flesh like all people, and the Hebrews wandering around with the sign of the king on them, not differentiated by God because they are like all people. They're the chosen ones of God, but Pharaoh is not different than they are. It's a radicalized view of humanity that it's hard for us to get our minds on. After the circumcision, things went downhill for the Jews for a very long time to the modern day. Not because of the circumcision, but because of what it said. The followers of Abraham and all of their descendants, down again to us, have had one basic message that the rest of the world has heard, and that message is, we are right and you are wrong. We know you have God's. We know you have methods of getting stuff that's broken outside of you. We know there's all kinds of things that you think, but you're wrong, dead wrong. All of it's wrong. Only we are right. There is one God, and we follow him, and he has made his will made known to us. And if you'll follow his will and follow him, it'll be better for you. If not, it's going to be a hard road. That is the least popular message in all of history. Can you, can you understand why? You likely have had somebody who didn't know anything about you show up in your life and tell you exactly what you should be doing differently than you are. If not, come be a preacher for a month. And, uh, it's, it's offensive. If you're worshiping the Pharaoh or whatever pantheon of gods and you're going about your life as well as you can, it's offensive to have some tribes, tribesman herder from nowhere, right, through the sign of circumcision, declare every time you see them, you and everything you think about life and about God and about self is absolutely unequivocally wrong, even though you belong to a great empire that has all the power and all the money and, and all of that good stuff, and, and I, I just exist with a bunch of sheep herders. I'm right and you're wrong, and you ought to change. That'll get you killed. You, you might know that. You do know that, don't you? It has all throughout history. Everybody who has the opportunity tries to wipe the Jewish people off the face of God's earth because, effectively, they're not kidding. Right? The message is, there's one God. We know him, and you ought to also. And if you don't, don't fool yourself. That may be magic. That may be hope. That may be whatever, but it ain't truth. Here we are, the inheritors of that singular burden to believe that there is just one God and that we know him and that we're locked in through the prophets and through the priest and through the Messiah into what he desires and requires of us. And the rest of the world is now gathering momentum and power to tell us that's absolutely wrong, right? We see the hypocrisy. We see Christians not living any differently than anybody else. What you're saying is a bunch of nonsense. And, and I'm going to worship the tree or the rock or the goddess or whatever I want to because I don't believe in your God because I don't believe in you because you don't show any signs that make me think I should listen to you. The sign is no longer circumcision. The sign is a spiritual value and a way of being. What God requires of the followers in this day, actually beginning with the time of Christ, was a less of a dependence on the law, though the law never changes, and much more of a willingness to stick out like sore thumbs by the quality with which we interact with our enemies and those who would harm us. Most Christians are unwilling to be marked with that marking of God. Most Christians want to default to, if you agree with me and think like me, then I can see God in you, but if you differ in politics or religion in any way, shape, or form, then God is not in you, you're the problem, and you're going to go to hell. We are called to a higher standard we're called to the standard of grace. 
circumcision, which is the first actual law that God lays down for his people, the first dyed-in-the-wool rule, is a mark upon the sexual member of men. And in the modern age, that has import because what we debate in our society and in the church today is all about sexuality. I am a biblical Christian, and I believe the teachings of Scripture about purity. I believe that God asks and requires of us a certain way of life in our sexual being. I believe that fervently. But I live in a world where I am very frequently sticking out because of those beliefs. I am taunted, sometimes called names. I am dismissed. I am stereotyped, and people believe things about me which I hope are not true. They believe because of my beliefs that I am a hate monger, that I'm disgusted by people who disagree or who live differently than me, that I judge in all in the negative other human beings who have different thoughts on sexuality, and none of that is true. I don't hate anybody. I don't hate them for tattoos. I don't hate them for being drunks. I don't hate them for their sexuality. I don't. I get it. And my observation about human sexuality is the same as I've made twice already. Those who say, look, what's, what's wrong in your life, the turmoil, the, the hardship, it can be actually cured by the expression of sexuality that's outside of what Scripture calls for. They're trying to find a way to find the peace that we all want. My observation is it doesn't seem to result in peace. It doesn't work. No matter how much sex you have or what kind of sex you have, the repetitive nature of the flesh never gives rise to the internal nature of God in our hearts. It just doesn't work. That's my only judgment. I'm sorry for people who get hurt or, or uh, who have to deal with the after effects of, of different things that happen because of, of sexual forays, but I don't hate anybody. I don't even think they're worse than I am. I've spent most of my life trying things that didn't work in order to get the heart healed. As Christians in the modern day, we really stand in a a difficult circumstance. Some of our brothers and sisters as Christians, right, they are doubling down on what Jesus requires of them is to hate full force, to judge and demean and dismiss and not allow people uh, uh, because of their sexuality in the church or whatever. That's just crazy to me. Here's what I know. I've never met a person who's hateful who was healed. Never. And I don't care how righteous they were in their hatred. We're called to walk around with the mark of Christ in and on us, which is to say you treat human beings like human beings. If you disagree with the way somebody's living, if your experience and your observation is it doesn't work, well, then you're going to want to prove that your way works not by your judgment or condemnation, but by the quality of the grace that you express in your relationships. Does that make sense? If you want to strike a blow for the cause of Christ in the modern world, marching against other people or shouting them down or calling names, that's just foolishness. If you want to proclaim the truth of Christ, you want people to know right away when they are in your presence there's something about you, then that has to do with the genuine love that you're able to have for people that you don't agree with. It really is. It's how we're supposed to stand out. I get the anger, I get the judgment, I I get the other things because we're all human beings imperfectly trying to figure out how to fulfill the will of God. And sex is a big deal to God all throughout the scriptures. But a bigger deal is grace. Turn the other cheek, go the second mile, offer the coat as well as the shirt. How many times do we have to do that nonsense, says Peter? Seven times 70, says Jesus. So when I go to annual conference, I have a tendency to find great restaurants and do things like go to tattoo shows. I like to walk around the grounds of the Capitol. Sometimes I I like to stop and talk to homeless people. They're usually very interesting. I like to do anything but go into the annual conference with all the other Christians. Do you know why? Ain't nobody loving me there. 
I am the vast minority of maybe 10 in our annual conference, and they treat me like dirt. Our bishop is kind and generous of nature. In case she watches this sermon, it's, it's true, right? But my colleagues and the, and the setup of the annual conference, they consider me to be an anachronism, old-fashioned. They, they think of me as a hate monger. They think I'm broken. They think I'm evil, and they wish my kind would just leave. So I don't spend a great deal of time in those great halls. But when I'm in the great halls with those who hate me for my beliefs, I try my best to equip myself well and to show the mark of Christ by the quality of my interactions, by inquiring how people are doing, by telling them I'll pray for them, and by trying my best to be unobtrusive and not bring shame on biblical Christianity. I don't know what lays ahead for us. I just don't. I do know this. As your pastor, I believe Scripture because when I have followed Scripture, it has done the thing that I needed done. Following more fully and more fully the teachings of Scripture has freed me in a way that I didn't think was possible. I'll never stop believing that. I also believe that Scripture teaches gracefulness and gentleness of nature even with those who are angry and upset and don't care for people like me. And as best I can, I'm going to try to exhibit that spirit. I would encourage you in your life to look at how your faith manifests in your relationships, what kind of person it makes you, how other people receive you, and to accept the challenge as biblical Christians to live lives worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ and to show the modern mark of circumcision, which is to say, to show that we are willing to serve Christ to an extreme that manifests in genuine love and concern for everyone, not just for the ones like us. It's a difficult task, very hard. But I kind of think having the whole tribe circumcised out there in the middle of nowhere and then going back to Canaan land probably wasn't the easiest thing ever. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And it certainly wasn't easy to be on the cross for the likes of me. It really wasn't. Because sometimes in my life, I haven't even cared. A life of faith is a life that continues to repeat those things which bring what is desired, which is peace, and learning to love people that we disagree with I'm telling you, that is the way of circumcision in the modern day. Join me in monitoring our attitudes and our actions in this difficult time in history. Let's acquit ourselves well and bring to the name of Jesus Christ a good standing. We'll try again next week.